I'm your host, Derek Asante, and um, we're back with another episode. I just got disconnected with my guests, but I'm going to wait until they get back on. In the meantime, I'll make sure I introduce them and bring them in when they uh, log back on. We're using Zoom, so I do apologize for any technical difficulties for this episode, uh, but we're going to do our best to make it work. Now, this brother that I have with me today is a special one and an individual that really I've known for many years and regardless of how much time goes by, we're able to still reconnect as if nothing happened. And that's the beauty of of, uh, relationships like these ones where it doesn't matter how much time passes, you know that the love and respect is is always going to be mutual and is always going to be there. Now, my brother's journey is ever evolving as he continues to grow in every aspect of his life. Now, we're going to learn a lot more about him, um, but without further ado, let me just call him so I can get him on here and then we can make this happen. Uh, Please help me welcome none other than Spin. Uh Welcome. Welcome. Brother, it is an honor, man. Thank you for having me on. Man, I appreciate you making this work because I know know you're always a man that's on the move. Now... Now, this this pod, if you get a chance, you probably listen to the first episode and kind of get an idea of why I started it. But it's really to have these types of conversations, right, oh. that that not every day we get to have with the people that, you know, you respect and you appreciate and that you learn a lot from. And so that's why it's important for me to have these conversations, because your journey alone is going to inspire someone else. Um, my journey may inspire someone else, but I think that's what it is we always look externally for sources and you're one of those sources that i think other people listening to this episode is going to definitely benefit from in so many different ways that they they don't even recognize it um and i I, i'm very confident just because of who i know you are that there's a lot there's a lot that people are gonna have to play this episode again just to get some of those other gems that they're gonna get um from from this conversation here now, with every episode, I start with a quote, and I want to get your opinion and your thoughts, what comes to mind when you hear this quote, right? The quote that I have for you is by Zora Neale Hurston, and it oh. reads, it reads, love makes our soul crawl out from its hiding place. What comes <laughs> to mind when you hear that? Damn, bro, I got emotional. Y'all ain't going to get me emotional right out of the <laughs> <laughs> that's how we got to do it man that's how we got to do it <laughs> and, and we haven't we haven't caught up in a minute so I, i'm actually engaged brother yeah man i appreciate that and um that's dope that's dope congrats the woman i'm engaged to thank you brother the the queen that i'm engaged to i mean that's the first thing that that popped in my head when i heard that quote you know i want to share that with her crawling out of what is it again the end love of- love um, love makes your soul crawl out from its hiding place. Yeah, brother. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? This is what it makes me think of. Um, I actually got a my 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 first poetry book ever is going to be published. It's ninety percent finished. Damn. Love across the border, a chronology, and it's detailing how the relationship with my queen started long distance through the pandemic. Wow. And how we've been able to work it to a point where we're starting to share a lot more time together. And it's a whole journey. So I, I share that to say that there's a portion in the book where I talk about how God told me that she was coming. Wow. So for most of my life, I sought validation in the arms of women. And I, I left a whole mess of heartbreaks and trail of tears behind me, you know, in my quest to try to find validation because i didn't realize that i was sufficient Mm. and i got to that place finally wow uh i remember i ended up in two situationships back to back and the second one i was just kind of like over it man and i remember having this fear of like man i'm in my 40s you know i got a lot of weight that i need to lose i don't even got no prospects i might i might end up dying alone that thought used to terrify me and I remember this specific time because I was going to end up seeing the woman, the situationship woman at a meeting that I didn't want to, but I had no choice. And 
I looked around my place and it was clean, tidy. I had healthy food that I had cooked in the fridge. I had peace in my heart. And I said, you know, if that's what it is, that's what it is. I had this peacefulness about me. And so fast forward to I had a week where I had four four nights in a row. God spoke clearly to me of love and tenderness. And by the fourth day, I was like, okay, there's a woman coming to me. Mm. And I remember sitting with a friend in the car and I was upset and I was crying, brother. I was like, why? Why is this happening? Like, I finally found peace. You know, I was hiding. I finally found peace. And I just remember hearing God's voice because you are ready. You know, Damn. and about a week later, we just started connecting. It was off Instagram. We'd been following each other, but we never really exchanged. And I mean, one thing led to another, you know, we ended up meeting in person. The chemistry was there. The vibes was there. And, you know, we're going on three years now, brother. Wow. And the process has not been smooth at all. Man, <laughs> you know? that's... Like, no, bro, there's been, there's a pain in your heart that only a woman you love can cause. Right? <laughs> <laughs> part of what that is is that I've had to crawl out of that that hiding place, you know, to, to truly experience love. And uh, I I love that quote, brother. That's that's literally our relationship, man. You know, it's crazy. It, it, I put some thought into these quotes for each person that I'm going to speak with because I have to. I, I value the fact that it has to resonate with them in some way. And sometimes oh. when it's even when it's a stranger, it's like based on the small conversations that we've had, I try to find one that will actually make a connection with them. And I'm glad this one hit home. Like, it, it was a home run. And, and I didn't expect this home run. <laughs> it's a grand slam over here. <laughs> I heard the quote. I was like, damn, how they're going to do me like this? <laughs> that's dope. That's, 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 this is the first episode where we started off this deep right away. Like, this is, this is awesome. This is awesome. I love it. I love it. So, now I want to backtrack because you told me a whole lot about the present. I'm going to go back. I want to find out a little bit more about you. Um, and I want the listeners to also have a better understanding of who this man is who just opened up this episode with so much of himself. Oh. Where were you born? And, and, what you call home, like what's the roots? Share a little bit uh, of that with us. Um, I was born in Guatemala in Central America, a uh, land of the feathered serpent bird of the Mayan people. And uh, I had to leave on the day of my 11th birthday. I became a refugee because of the political war and the unrest. And, uh, you know, my whole life changed. At the wow. age of 11, I ended up going to six elementary schools in five different countries. Wow. And um, I never really felt home anywhere. Even when I would go back to visit, I felt so out of place because I had missed my formative years. Mm. I mean, I had my formative years, but like your teenage years, you really start to develop. You know, I missed a lot, a lot of my culture during that time. And so now... I would say home is where my peace is. Mm. And thankfully, I've been able to find peace in many places. Ah, that's um, awesome. I would say initially, the most peaceful times I had in my life was in Bogwax, St. Catherine in Jamaica, uh, an indigenous territory, a health suck territory in a community known as Bella Bella in northern BC. And... Um, yeah, the Mayan pyramids in Tikal in Guatemala. What, 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 sorry, what was it about those places that brought you that peace? Great question, man. I'm really loving this podcast already. <laughs> you know, what it was about those places is that I felt like I was in the zone. I went to Jamaica for an exchange program. Mm. And I had all these privileged white kids from Canada in the program with me that, that the Jamaicans couldn't stand, that I couldn't stand. And... <laughs> and I felt more at home with the Jamaicans than I did with the Canadians, you know? Yeah. And uh, so the whole time there, I was living my full potential. I was living life to the fullest. In uh, Bella Bella, and I was fresh off a of heartbreak from one of those two situationships I mentioned earlier. Mm. And I was feeling so devastated and so worthless. And my brother, Saul Brown, 
love this dude. He just took me out to the water, you know, this ancestral water. It's a 15,000 year old territory. Wow. And uh, it's like they call it a bath. So you go in, it's ice cold and there's cedar and you kind of like whip yourself with the cedar to shake off all the bad energy and all the pain and all the agony. And it was a very transformative moment, man. I can honestly say I started to pick myself up at that point. And the pyramids in Tikal is just, you're looking at a at a rainforest from above it. No you way. go up these wooden stairs for what feels like an eternity. And when you get to the top of the pyramid, there's nothing but the top of trees all around you. For as oh, far wow. as your eye can see, it's the most majestic sight ever. And so those memories were like a decade apart and then five years apart. And that last trip to Bella Bella, where I started to kind of find the healing, I started to realize home needs to be where my peace is. And I need to manifest that peace wherever I go. You know, and that's, yo, that's, that's incredible because what you just broke down for me was what I've been thinking about for a while, which is peace is not always going to be external of you. It's going to be internal. It's got to mm -hmm. be, you got to find it in there and then add on to it with everything that's around you, right? Because to, to me, because when you describe these places and the experience as brief, of they, as, brief of, as they are, what I'm getting from it is you got stillness, you got an opportunity to kind of just be, right? And, and let the, the natural, the earth and everything else kind of do what it's supposed to do for your body, your mind and, and your spirit because... Here, as you already know, we're just going and going and going and going. There's no time for you to even breathe properly. The air is toxic, and you're just on constant go. You have no idea where you're going, though, but you're, you got to watch the watch, uh, the clock and, and see what's yep. happening. you got to clock in, be at this meeting, be there. Somebody's pulling you, calling you, but you never get that break. And so when you go to these places, what I'm hearing is I got to be still yep. and think and reflect and appreciate who I am and what I've accomplished and what I've, what I'm doing for others around me. Like I, that's what I'm getting from it. So absolutely, brother. I think B. Like I remember, Common had that album B. Yes, classic. And like I I, I get that song now. You know, yeah. I used to hear it. It's like, oh, this is cool. But once you start to live it, you get yeah. it. And being able to be, that's absolutely, it. man. That's it. How many how many siblings do you have? I'm an only child on my mother's side. Okay. On my father's side, well, the sperm donor, because he wasn't really <laughs> my father, he doesn't get that privilege. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, I actually got a half brother my age, you know, so oh, my wow. mom and I were not his real family, mm. quote unquote. You know, so I've carried a lot of that anger uh, uh, and abandonment that a lot of young men carry in our souls from, from the absence of the father. Um, so I'm my mama's only child, man. And it's, it's, uh, wow. a lot of people assume that I'm spoiled because of it, but my mom, I got a Latina mother, man. She's tough, so. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm spoiling. laughs> wow. Say that, man, but she raised me proper, man. She raised me tough. Yeah. She had to raise me and raise me by herself. And yeah. I'm really grateful to her. So. Yeah, I got, I'm my only child biologically, but there's a lot of close people that I consider family, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, Um, Who obviously included, even even though it's been so long, yeah. it's just mentioned at the start of the podcast that that bond is there, it's strong, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. I, I didn't yeah. know that. I didn't know, I thought you had like a, another sibling, but I didn't want to uh, assume, that's why I want to ask that, because I didn't know, but that's that's dope to know. Is there that guy do, but I've never met them because he kept them separated. You know. Oh, so up separated. until this day, you don't know who your other the, the half brother nah, is. Man. And I made my peace with that because. Yeah. Fuck, am I gonna do it? Oh, sorry, man. Can I? Right. No, no. Yeah, yeah, you can cuss. Yeah, the fuck am I gonna do it? <laughs> I'm forty-four years old. I became a man without him. I yeah. Gave my mother's last name, and. You know, shit, it's, it's what it is, man. Yeah. I, it, I can smile about it now, but I cried many a night over all of this. Wow. So I'm, I'm, think, I'm thinking <laughs> about, sorry to cut you, I'm thinking about you leaving what was your birthplace by 11, and then what was your next stop? Because I'm trying to figure out, 
what were some of your early memories of your childhood and how would you describe that to us? Uh, well, you know, ironically enough, the earliest memory of my childhood, and I think it'll play into like our conversation later on, was an argument he had with my mother at a park and mm. him storming off. And I had this red balloon in my hand. And as he stormed off and my mother was crying, I started crying and I let go of the balloon and I saw the balloon drift off into the air as I saw him drift off into nothingness. And, you know, one thing I'd like to share to the listeners is if you have certain, if you have certain animosity towards things, like for me, I hated the color red for a long time and I never knew why. Mm. And it wasn't until I was able to piece back that memory that that red balloon signified the abandonment of my father. And so what I did for one year is I just rocked red everywhere because that was my way of making my peace with it. Mm. So that was one of the earliest memories. Um, Leaving Guatemala, we went to Costa Rica and we were there for 10 months as refugees. And it was a very unstable time. We were fortunate to get out of the country. Um, A lot of my mother's childhood friends were murdered and tortured by the military back home. Um, Wait, 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 wait. So you... You're hearing about this. You're you're living it. You're in it. What was it like for you? Because I'm assuming you're, what, 12 at this point? Yeah, man. I was 10, 11. I actually, it really fractured my relationship with God because what happened was my mother and her best friend were working on a project to create a cooperative in a community where, in an indigenous community where the men had been massacred by the military. And so all the women had, um, I mean, they couldn't read or write. And all they had was these beautiful textiles that they made. So my mother and her best friend got funding from a Mexican agency to teach the women to create a cooperative so they could sell their textiles and bring literacy projects. And in the midst of that, my mother's best friend was disappeared by the military in broad daylight. And we literally had to leave. Like We had like five days to leave. And it was a really scary time, man. You know, as a child, you don't know what the hell we're trying to help. What's going on here? I really hated God at that time in my life because I didn't understand why. There's a phrase back home, aquí no es bueno que ayuda, sino que no jode, which is, is translated in, in English as uh, here, it's not the person who helps that's good. It's the person who doesn't piss anyone off. Wow. So you kind of got to just keep to yourself, mind your own business. And, and uh, we were trying to help, you know, and... and our life got turned upside down after that. Damn. That's you know, what's crazy to me as I hear you say that is that's the complete opposite of the person that I've, I've gotten the privilege of meeting <laughs> and we'll get into that, but that's crazy at that. And like, I can understand why you, you obviously had a resentment towards God because that definitely shifted your whole perspective on everything that you were told prior to that. Right. Yeah. Damn. We try to do all the right things, you know? And, uh, I'm I'm honestly thankful for everything I've gone through, and I take pride in having been a refugee. Mm. And I think sometimes when we go through struggles, we are so tormented by them that we try to bury them and and forget the shame that we went through at one point. And we lose a lot of power by doing that. Yeah. You know, my power lies in the fact that I was a refugee. You know what I'm saying? That I was raised by a single mother, that my father wasn't around. Those things that caused me so much pain and so much agony and tears is what makes me powerful beyond measure now. Now, you know, that's thank you for that. That's I'm curious. I can already hear what some of the benefits are, but what were the, some of the benefits to you um, and how you were raised by your mother? Man, she raised me tough, man. She raised me proper with values, with integrity. You know, even though we went through all that we went through, she still has a caring heart, you know, to this day. And she instilled that in me. So, you know, the the man you got to know is the man that she raised, Mm -hmm. you know. And she gave me the freedom to make my own decisions. So we would go to church. She got a scholarship uh, to Louisville University in Kentucky and, I went up there. I learned English uh, in Kentucky in about like two months. Mm. Um, and I remember her taking me to church and me making all these excuses to not want to go to church. 
And one Sunday morning, she looked at me and she said, if you don't want to be there, I understand. I want you to want to be there. I don't want you to go there because I want you to go there. And that that conversation, that moment, to this day, I thank her so much for it because I've been able to find my home within, you know, the Mayan cosmovision, the spirituality. I'm comfortable. I've fasted during Ramadan with my Muslim brothers. I've, I've gone to church. My queen is a Christian, like a devoted Christian. And so it opened up my mind to really understand the world from different angles and levels. And mm-hmm. she gave me the freedom to do that as a young child. And I think the biggest thing I can thank her for is the capacity of critical thinking. You know, wow. we're in a world right now where everybody's just running right or left, depending on what they're following on Instagram. And there's no yeah. middle ground. Yeah. 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 It, if there was anything you can change about your upbringing, what would it be? Mm. Mm. I would. I would have liked to have found a therapist who understood all my complexities mm. early. I have an amazing therapist now, man. I love her deeply. I needed her since I was a child because mm-hmm. I had all this anger inside of me. And, you know, my mother, bless her soul, she did her best, but she did yell. And so I grew up accustomed to that. Mm-hmm. And so then I yelled. And I can't blame her for it. You know, we're not responsible for what we go through as children but we are responsible for how we respond to what we went through as men. Mm. And uh, That's a big I've one. caused a lot of pain because I didn't get the therapy that I should have early. Dang. So that's one thing I would change. So because, because you mentioned therapy, I'm curious how you expressed yourself as a kid with everything that you experienced. Like what was your outlet? What were the moments that you got to be a child? What, were, what did they look like? Basketball, man. I, I love basketball. I love shooting hoops. Dope. And I was just out on the court just doing my thing. Um, I'd say around 12 or 13, I started writing poems. No way. Yeah. But, you know, I'm going to keep it real with you. I was actually trying to rap, but I couldn't <laughs> land. <laughs> <laughs> the flow wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> so it was always like the one to be a rapper. Like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> so hip hop introduced you to poetry, huh? By default. Hip-hop introduced me to poetry, man. My first hip hop song was Ghetto Bastard by Naughty by Nature. No way. Man, I remember watching the video. And seeing this dude just pissed off and his dad never knew my dad. And like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah, motherfucker, that's how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just so much anger that he expressed. And, you know, yeah. at the end of he never been to the ghetto, don't ever come to the ghetto. Because mm-hmm. you wouldn't understand the ghetto. So stay the fuck out of the, the ghetto. ghetto. Yeah. And I can't pretend I wasn't raised in the ghetto. I mean, a third world country is a ghetto. But right. I, I can't claim like a street life. That's not who I was. Mm-hmm. Although I was very comfortable <laughs> around people yeah. involved. Yeah. But I understood so much that whole concept of like, if you've never been here, yeah. don't ever come here because you won't understand it. Yeah. You know, that's kind of like the anger I carried in my heart. And so hip hop was just such an outlet, man. Like hip hop really saved my life. And, Dope. you know, I'm glad I couldn't land the beat early because spoken word is just such a beautiful medium and you're not restricted yeah and in hip-hop you gotta say yeah. what the fuck you're saying quickly yep. and perfect yeah. or you're off beat and the whole thing's a disaster yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's, there's a lot of restriction even though you can express yourself there's a lot of restriction and i think it makes it challenging for poets to really go into that realm and, and excel because it's different the way we think the way we play with words is challenging and it, we need that freedom to be able to express it but when you can find it you restrict us you kind of silence the poet when you do that right when you try to restrict them to a beat so i yeah. definitely agree with you on that now was there a lesson 
this is more about your adolescence, you know, up until maybe you're 14, 15. Was there a lesson that you learned early on that still stays with you today? Hell yeah, man. Um, there's two books I would encourage, like, parents of teenagers to make them read. Mm. One is called The Greatest Salesman in the World by Ogmandino. Okay. And the other one uh, is The Four Agreements. Um, Paulo Coelho, I think. Damn. These two books I read in high school, and they really, they define who I am, man. You know, the greatest salesman in the world has 10 principles. They're, they're scripts, scrolls that you read through, and you read them 30 times. Of, uh, you read them 30 days in a row, and then you go to the next one. And you read that 30 days in a row, and you do it three times a day. And I did that, and I was lacking a lot of self-esteem at the time. Mm. And just continually reading them, it really filled my mind and my heart with so much positivity and, and self-confidence. And then the four agreements, I think, I think the key lesson I learned out of everything is to always go the extra mile. Mm. Why? A lot of people, I feel, live their life in a mediocre way. They just want to get by. Like in high school, I could have been getting 90s, but I figured I could fuck around and I'll get 70s and I'll still pass. And right. so a lot of us kind of do the bare minimum. But, you know, I just came out of a public service job and all these motherfuckers are doing the bare minimum and they're getting paid well. Hey, hey, hey. I have hey, to leave because I can't be that person. Listen, listen. <laughs> you know, you already know. <laughs> Yeah. I've been there. I can feel that pain. Like it, bro, it hurts. Yeah. It hurts because you go into these things and this is a sidebar, folks. We'll get back to the conversation in a second, but you go into these things, you know, these positions and you mean well, like you want to do well. You want to actually help the people that you're in position to help and get them out of their situation. But when you keep hitting the same wall of, no, 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 don't do too much because we need to get funding again. Don't do too much. Yeah. The Band-Aid stuff. You know, but don't get me started. I know we can go we can go off that tangent and, and off the rail, but... I got a, I got a poem I want to drop for you at some point in the podcast, man. It's probably <laughs> fired my job. Can you do it? Can you do it now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, do it. <laughs> All right, here it goes, man. This is fresh, man. I just finished writing it. <laughs> They tell you you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket, huh? But want you to be loyal to one employer till you lying dead in your casket? Nah. Mm. See, the changes I had to make in my life was drastic, and I ain't got no hundred years left to live. I'm not plastic. So I fired my job. Fuck it. I quit. You see, when you got integrity, that public housing salary kills you slowly. I had to dip before I bust the super's lip. Racist motherfucker treating tennis like shit. And you know how it goes. Management's incompetent. Laziness is dominant. Robots in the government underserve communities just to be subordinate and protect their payroll. Hey, yo. <laughs> Social work is grimier than yeah, yo. Them demons walk with halos. A job you hate is fatal. I quit that shit. I hate all forms of mediocrity. They make your life their property. Won't even pay you properly. Ignore you on the front lines when they write the policy. I shook those leeches off of me. You should do that too. If you got a job you hate, it's slowly killing you. And everything's a hustle, dog. You should get one too, but not on the backs of the poor after all that they've been through. Because karma is a real one, homie. One day it could be you. Good thing is, karma never forgets. My homie Esco said it best. Bet she'll bless you when you least expect it. So set your intention to the world projected. Set your intention to the world projected. That reflection you see in the mirror protected. Shit, my job left me for dead. I quit six months ago. I'm resurrected. The fire inside of my heart didn't die. I just needed to reconnect it to every line that I write and every bar that I spit. What Jay say? All my papers legit. I slang words for a living. That's a given. I'm God protected. So even when I take an L, I'm still winning. I hate capitalism, but got a million ways to make a dollar. I love socialism, but I ain't trying to be living in no squalor. Ooh. See, any which way, I just don't trust authority. Shit, I walked away from a full-time unionized job with benefits and seniority. Mm. Regenerating my health was my priority. Mm. I'm a scholar of life. 
I flash through these boxes with a pen that doubles as a knife. Found myself a beautiful fiance. She's soon to be my wife. Ooh. This world I chose is uncertain, but I'm finally filled with life. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Bro, thank you for that, man. That, wow. Yeah, man. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I got, I got big plans, man. I got, I got to I'm going to perform this. And as the months go by, it's going to be like, I quit six months ago. I quit seven months ago. Yeah. I it's a living and piece. I'm going to release the video with like the months increasing. Wow. Man. Hold on. Is that going to be in the book? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's got to be in the book. That's like you're single. <laughs> yeah, bro. I, got, I got cover art and everything. <laughs> man. I'm looking forward to that, man. I'm looking forward to that book. That, that one's for the hood, bro. Mm. You, man, you know what it is. Listen, that's, that's beyond, though. That's transcending. Honestly, that piece is not just for the hood. That's true. That like, is true. Think about post-pandemic. How many people didn't want to go back to work? And yeah. still don't want to go to work. Yeah. So it's beyond the hood. Like, it's, there's no walls for this one. This one's going to hit home every home. Like, it's holy <laughs> <That's true>. shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> Life is too short. I mean, you look at, like, Trevor Noah walking away from the dating. Yeah. Show, like, that was, was post-pandemic. That's yeah. Trevor Noah went through it. Like, we yep. all going through this shit. Yep. Yep. Damn. Thank you for that, man. That was beautiful. That was dope. Oh, my pleasure, brother. I had to share that. <laughs> man. So, so the rap game didn't work out for you. We Not yet. <laughs> right? So we turned into a poet at that early age. Now, I'm curious. How, how would your peers back then in high school, how would they describe Spin? I was thinking about that when I started. Like, <laughs> actually used to call me medium punch. No I way. <laughs> <laughs> man, when that brother came out, I, I had the whole album memorized. They're like, yo, you're like a piece of fun. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's dope that I'm still in contact with with with, uh, with the core squad from high school. And um, we've been through a lot together, man. I take pride in still having those connections and still mm. remembering who that kid in high school was, you know, playing yeah. basketball. Um cutting class, splitting the bus tickets, all the little things yep. you do back in the day. And, uh, but always comfortable in who I was, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember um, there was this one kid that kept, like, roasting everybody in class, and I would just take it, I would take it, I would take it. And then one day I just lost it out of bed. I like, you know, he looked like Millhouse. He was black brother, but he looked like Millhouse. And I like, he been roasting me, like, half the school year. And then one day I was just like, Bro, your feet are dangling from the fucking chair. Ooh. And then you come in here and try to roast me every day. Like, what are you doing, bro? <laughs> <laughs> and it was over. <laughs> After that day, it was over, bro. <laughs> God, the whole school calls you no help. <laughs> oh, man. That, yeah, man. You, you, just, you just took me back to those days, man. Like, those were the days where you remember how cruel kids can be. You know what I mean? Oh, but, yeah, bitches. <laughs> but but the beauty in, in those days though is we can fight and be friends in a week. Easy, yeah. You see what I'm saying? Like we can fight, we can share, express our differences, and then move on. A week later we're talking again. It's I gotta shout out Oakwood, man, because it just there's something about Oakwood Collegiate. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been so much talent that came out of that school and oh, we yeah. were just I think I developed a really good sense of humor back then. Mm. You know. Mm. And in many respects, I feel like I'm still that guy, you know, like it, it's uh, I've evolved, but yeah. I definitely I'm thankful for high school, man. Yeah. Even though I went through some things and my mama kicked me out because I was being a terrible son to her. Mm. I was on student welfare before I even had a high school diploma. You know, I'm really thankful for all those experiences, man. That's it. It helps. It helps mold, right? Molds into. Yeah. Yeah. That's the character development there. Now, yeah. when when you thinking as we're reflecting here, I want I'm curious when you hear the word friend. What did it mean to you then, and what does it mean to you now as an adult? And that's a sticky one, man. Because that you know after after getting snaked x amount of times, yeah, like man, 
fuck friends. Yep. Um, <laughs> to me, it's like it's family now. It's, That's it. It's, it's family. It's family and acquaintances. That's it. Friendship with... is for the birds. <laughs> Hey, that's a fact. I, I, I'm with you on that because um, I find I had a, a real conversation with another brother of mine and it was about just females and how females kind of categorize their relationships, right? They have the BFF thing. Yeah. And so it was interesting because it came up and we we're saying, well, we don't use that because him and I address each other's brothers. And yeah. so I said, I don't. I'm not associating myself with that label of uh, a best friend because I don't mm. believe in that because it's flaky and the way people even treat their friends is a reflection of that. So yep. how you treat your brother is totally different than how you treat a friend. And so that's why I don't play with those labels. So I agree with you on, on that, that it's, it's not a thing for me. And, it, and I realize that as we keep talking and, and even that brother of mine, we're talking, the more we speak as brothers, we realize that, our language is completely different from the opposite sex and how yeah. we interpret. You know what I mean? Like our conversations are totally different than what our partners would have a conversation with, you know, their friends. And I think that's, that's very powerful and it's important for us to recognize that. But I think what you're doing, which we're going to get into a little bit later on is a testament to why it's important for more brothers to be having conversations. Yeah, right. It's a must. It's a must. We don't talk enough. We, we, I think the world has, has told us not to speak to each other. And, and, and based on the things that we go through and we experience, everything is telling us, no, I should look at you hard. I should look at you different. I should look at you with, with you know, um, um, frustration or anger or something as if you're my competition. As opposed to you being someone who's going to assist me and I'm going to assist you in whatever journey that you're going through, right? But we don't look at each other as support systems. We look at each other as opposition. Not even that, brother, but like, you know, and I was guilty of it earlier in my in my younger years. But like, oh, oh, I smashed this chick, I smashed mm. that chick. Yeah. Like it, it's uh, it's so fucking toxic. Like you just feel like you have to have had sex with like a thousand women, and you have had to like, it, it's all these things that we kind of measure each other by, which don't do nothing. Yeah. You know, it just leaves you in pain and agony at the end of the day. Like no matter how much. You know, women you've been with or whatever. If you if you're alone at night, or if you can't trust the woman you're with, none of that shit matters. Especially yeah. as you get older, you know. Yeah. And I think, you know, like I had homies that settled down before I did, and it and it sucked because it's like I wanted to go roll out and do, it, and I can't now because they got family man or mm-hmm. whatever. And, mm-hmm. and I was hating, but now like you know, I got my fiance and we're building our future, and I get it now. And I think. We need to have more conversations about building wealth, about what stocks to invest in, about, you know what I'm saying? Therapy. Yeah. Like normalize it. I, I, I speak about my therapist on my on my social media to normalize it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's an everyday thing. I, if you after these two years of the pandemic don't need a therapist, there is definitely something wrong with you. Right? Well, and that's the thing. You haven't even identified that there's something wrong. right? <laughs> yeah, man, there's no way we made it through these two years of hell and don't need therapy. Bro. Right. Right. Man. So I want to push forward a little bit. I don't want to talk about spoken word. Now, uh. we understand that the rap thing didn't work out. And that's why we made the jump. Yes. But the minute, <laughs> the minute you got engaged with spoken word and you married it, and now you're, you know, you're, it's in your blood. Yeah. Like, what did that do for you as a person? Now? Like, where did that shift come from? As far as how did you start looking at your friends, the world, and everything around you? Like, what did it do for you? How did it shake you as an individual? And it, it like poetry became my basketball. You know, like mm. I had finished high school. We all have hoop dreams. It didn't work out. Like, now what am I gonna do? Right. And I wasn't as active anymore, but I started to channel my emotions to the poetry. Yeah. And I was very fortunate that I got a lot of love early on. There's this book called The Artist Way that I'd recommend to anybody that has any type of artist affinity. It's a really solid book to help you kind of process your journey as an artist. And uh, it talks about the support that an artist gets early in their career is critical for like their long term development. So mm-hmm. if you go share an open mic, uh, people are like, bro, you're trash. You might never go back and open mic again, and you might be like one of the dopest poets out here. That's right. That's right. What's so the, I was fortunate. Sorry, what's the, what's the book called? Sorry to cut you. The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. 
the artist way by julia cameron well, yeah know. you got you gotta read that brother i'm gonna look that up that i'm definitely gonna get life. that that book liberated me man it, it uh it liberated me from a lot of these petty insecurities that artists go to. I really don't give a fuck anymore mm, <laughs> because of that book. Um, so how it shifted me is it just got me. I, I think it, it went a little too good at the start of my career, man. I had a lot of attention from the ladies. It's like groupies is a thing. You know, yeah. if you do anything as an artist, they are going to be groupies and it just it fucked my head up, man. I got too much uh, attention too quickly, and I just, I was a hot mess, bro. Was, wow. I've done my best to apologize to the women <laughs> that I heard at that time of my life, you know, but... Oh, wow. Yeah, that shit fucked me up, man. I blew I an amazing relationship I had. I, um... That was just an asshole, man. It, it made me an asshole, and I'm thankful I came out on the other side of that, mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm good and I'm grounded now, you know, yeah. but I mean... Yeah, I had like a little hate club going at one point at York University. You, did. you know, and yep. I mean, to deserved, I would say, <laughs> but also like, you know, people be toxic and gossip and chit chat is we keep running and then so you never get a breathing room to grow and heal. You just always that asshole to them. Yeah. And yeah. I'm comfortable with that at this point in my life because I've really worked hard to move with a clean heart and you know what I'm saying, been faithful to my woman and like I'm at peace. Um mm -hmm. But I think it just flipped my whole world upside down, the way I see things, the capacity, the critical analysis, the critical mm. thinking that my mother instilled in me to be able to articulate it. Um, I'm at a point now where I'm reviving my career, and I'm so honored to be in this podcast with you because you're catching me on the rebirth side of it. Dope. You know, I've been I just did a feature in Atlanta in Decatur. I do the L Uno. I love my brother down there. And I've been going to slams in Florida and like ripping shit. But I'm moving with more humility. Like I know the skill set I have, but I'm also not trying to be that asshole again. Like right. I really want to just take the blessings God has given me with this craft and, and multiply them this time around. Wow. Do you remember Gorillas of the Word? Yeah, brother. <laughs> Flashback, <laughs> <laughs> now, now, I know you were going through some stuff then, but I want to take the opportunity to actually give you some flowers for for that group because you gave me an opportunity that forever changed my life. Oh wow! And no, for real, because you caught me at that time where I was trying to find my voice and how I can share my poetry. And, and that opportunity did it for me because wow. until that moment, I'd never been on a stage like a legit stage to say, I'm going to actually share with other strangers. You know what I mean? And so True. you don't I've never told you this, but I think this is a perfect opportunity for me to tell you <laughs> that because because no, because it's 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 been something that I, I literally dug up that book that we created and I went through that and I said, there's a reason why my connection to you will never change. It will never, you know, fall short. And it's because although there was a lot happening in that group, <laughs> you, sure but, was. no, but you were the constant. Yeah. You were the constant. Even when other people came in, wanted to kind of take it over, you were still the constant. You were still the voice to say, nope, this is how I want to do it. This is how I want. Nope, nope, I'm doing it for these guys. Like, you went to bat for us then. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, I don't know if anybody else gave you your credit, but you need to hear it from me, at least because I can only speak for me and my experience with that, that journey. But I want to thank you because if you didn't do that for me or, you know, do that initiative at that time and invited me into it, and actually took care of me while I was there. You didn't abandon the group. You know what I mean? And I think that's something that I need to commend you for because you did change a lot of things about me and how I wanted to carry myself and what poetry did for me because it did a lot for me. It was my therapy. And being able to yeah. be in that circle with you guys to share and talk about worldly things. We were young. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, like think about that. We were talking about things across seas. 
that yeah. didn't that may have not had a direct impact to us personally, but it did so much that we had to speak on it. You know what I mean? So I want to just take that moment to kind of thank you for that. And that's why I bring up that 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 book because that did a lot for me at that time. And it did a lot for me wow. and who I am today and why you and I are still connected. It was because I of I really appreciate you telling me that, brother. Like you know, at that time I was I mean, I was a youth myself, you know. Yeah. And we were get able to get the grant funding and it was funny because we landed I don't know, some small grant. Yeah. We landed something. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, all these people started coming to fuck with me. And yeah. Like, yeah. All, all of a sudden, everybody wants to reach out. And then people's trying to claim our group. Yep. You know, I'll never forget that. Yep. One of my elders actually sat there and played me the voice message of another agency that was trying to claim us. And I sent a letter, man. I sent a letter to the funders, to them, to the everybody I could think of sending a letter to yep. in defense of us. Because we all were working hard. and. Yep traumas and tears and everything and some other people's gonna come try to claim us and you know i made my peace with everything that happened at, at that time um mm -hmm. there was a young sister that was really pissed off at me for a while and, and when we finally were able to talk and un unpack everything i realized is that she had held me in such high esteem and i didn't even realize yeah. the position that i was being held in you know and i think you know, sometimes people might come across a certain way, but it's really that I wasn't valuing myself, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and I've always been kind of like the blunt dude, too. So that always kind of rubs people the wrong way. Yeah. But, you know, we did make our peace. And I could say, yep, yeah, cool with everybody. You know, it took different amount of time to kind of get cool with everybody after yeah. all that. But, yeah, everyone's still, still there, man. It was a beautiful that time was such a beautiful time for me because like, like I didn't know what housing was at the time. I just mm -hmm. saw a group of youth that connected with me in different forms yeah. and we all just vibed and said, fuck it. You know, yeah. later on I ended up finding out about like housing, hood, all this other shit that was involved, but mm -hmm. we were just a group of poets. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and that's how my mother raised me, you know, like don't, don't watch nothing. Just, just be cool. And, uh, it's special, man. I'm glad. I'm glad you reminded me of that because you know I'm still doing the youth work. You know, yeah. I've, 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 I learned a lot, and it's messy. Youth work is messy. Oh, yeah. you know, a lot of people don't realize that, man. It's, there's no way around the mess. Nope. nope. So, one thing with me now that I've learned is be very mindful, especially with the dudes. Mm. Be very mindful, man. If there's any like fuck boys or anything, I'm not. I just don't even want them in the circle because. You know, they start engaging in certain ways towards the women in the group or being disrespectful. Like that's that's a no go for me. I don't yeah. play that shit. And yeah. you know, I'll I'll mentor as best I can, but if I start seeing like predatory behavior and shit like that, I don't I don't want you know mm. I can't. I've I've gone through too much and you know even with the thoughts I've had as far as, as verbal, you know, and the way I've spoken and disrespectfully to women in the past, I don't want to be associated with anything further that's, that's hurting women or causing women pain. So I've actually had to like rescind offers for features to artists or like ban them from my space. I'll, I'll, I'll speak with them. I'll let mm. them know the information that was given to me that it was firsthand. I'll ask to hear their side. And then I'll explain myself, you know, um, and it's, it's difficult, but it's one thing if it's third party information and it's gossip and shit, but it's when it's like women that are entrusting you with their own lived experience, I feel like it's a different level of responsibility you got to take on. No. And, uh, yeah. So gorillas <clears throat> of the word really kind of gave me that foundation to be mindful when I move forward, man. So, um, I, I went on the website. And I checked it out. Great website, by the way. Um, a lot, a lot of information in there. And I think um, everyone should, you know, I'm gonna make sure I put the link in the in the description of this episode just so you can get it because you do need to check it out. It's not just words on the website. He's got videos and he's got real information and the transparency in that website like really moved me because I wasn't anticipating that. Yeah. When you told me to go and check it out, I was just like, wait a minute. What? 
why so much? So let's start there. Why why did you feel the need to be so transparent on there? Was it more for you and your ther therapeutic process? Or was it just like a disclaimer for everybody to know and be aware of where you stand? Like, what, what was it about? So before I even had it on the website, it was a it was a part of my just protocol of being like uh, I've been blessed to t spend a lot of time in indigenous communities and prior and informed consent is a very important mm -hmm. free prior and informed consent is very important. That means that you want to give people the opportunity to consent in my case, to engage with me. Mm -hmm. And in order to do so, it's important that they know my past and where I've come from. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I have been verbally abusive in relationships and I've my queen. When we started talking, I let her know up front, you know, I, if I get I got nominated for an award for the Jayu Film Festival, I sent them over to the website to the statement. Now, part of why I decided to put it on the website is because I've been subjected to a lot of uh, lateral violence. Mm. So, again, with the gossip and all this. So there's a lot of shit that's been said that, you know. There's certain individuals out there that just have it out for me. Yeah. Um, and that's the case with a lot of people. And as you, you know, grow in prominence and this shit's just going to happen. It's mm -hmm. what it is. They used to torment me. Mm -hmm. So at one point I was so self-conscious about whatever the fuck it was that people were saying that I wasn't even going out to public events or anything. This was long after Gorillas of the Word. I would mm -hmm. like not go nowhere. I, I spent about two years just kind of hiding from public events because I thought the whole world hated me. And... Over time, I started to narrow down where all this shit was coming from and the few individuals that were behind it all. And um, I made my peace with it. I did an interview with the Forgiveness Project called Look Both Ways on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I told my truth, you know, and I have a brother, Marcel Wilson from One by One Movement. And he says, if you don't tell your story, someone else will tell it for you. Yeah. And so I decided to tell my story. Um and some of it, it ain't even got nothing to do with me. It's supporting a friend of mine and he was in a custody battle and it was really ugly. Uh, but we have everything documented in, in, in his defense. Right. So, mm -hmm. But just nobody ever asks because a lot of times people just just run. Right. Word is wind. It's easy to poison people's perspectives these days. Yeah. yeah. So I decided to put it on my website because. I wanted to. I mean, I was already doing that anyway, mm -hmm. and it was kind of getting. I don't want to say it's getting tiring, but it's like, here, just go check this link. Mm -hmm. You know, just check it on your own time. If you if you read it and you're not cool, I respect that. You know, okay, you want to offer me this position, this prominent position, go read this shit before you offer it to me. Yeah. If you want to yeah. withdraw it, I respect that. But I, I don't want no one else to come at you and tell you shit. I want you to hear from me. Right, right. And then you make your decision. If you hear other shit that I didn't say there, that shit ain't true, let me, you know, feel free to come and speak to me about yeah. it. But it's it's been pretty much a protocol for me, whether it's awards, like, and that's why I had you read it as well. Um, I've been harassed online by individuals. I've I've had to block upwards of fifteen accounts. You know, wow. just it's it's a thing. I actually want to do a workshop around how to deal with online harassment. Wow. Um, not that I'm fearful of my safety or anything at this point of my life, but it it just became really annoying and you know there's some people that are just not mentally well out there and and at this point in my life i honestly just pray. like i don't have ill will towards people i pray for their healing mm -hmm. and for them to leave me the fuck alone because it ain't i'm living my life you know what i'm saying i'm yeah. not out here to hurt nobody um in 2020 covid happened everybody's depressed all this q and i shit is going on everyone's Everyone was confused, bro. I seen a whole different side of people that year. Yeah. I was like, oh, man, yeah, you, yeah. Too, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I had to really kind of start distancing myself. Like a lot of people went cuckoo, and yeah. all that turned out to, a lot of it turned out to be bullshit, you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah, 2020 was bad, bro. And, and that was that was when I said, let me just put this shit on my website and whatever other inferences or whatever people want to do, it's on them. But this is my truth. I'm at peace with it. I'm prepared to deal with the consequences. I have, you know, caused pain with my words. There is a lot of learning and unlearning I've had to do as a man and through therapy to behave differently. I've also learned about health and your mm -hmm. gut, 
you know, sometimes if you're if you're constantly angry, it might not even be that you're a mean person. Your gut might just be fucked up and you might just need to cleanse it and detox it. And that'll start to balance out the hormones. Mm. And I'm actually going through a protocol like that right now. And and it is mind blowing to me. Like I never thought for one second, wait, maybe there's like a gut infection and they need to stop eating this bullshit, clean out the system. And as I was going through it, I was observing all these changes in the hormones and the mood. And then eventually I made it through to the other side. So I was, that was going to be my next question, actually, about your health issues. Talk to yeah. me about the gut, because I don't know much about the gut. I heard about a little bit here and there snippets, but and I've heard you mention it. You posted a few things about it as well. Absolutely. But can you share some insight for just the average person who might be listening to this for the first time and saying, what is this guy talking about, the gut? Like, how is my gut yeah. uh, an essential piece of my health? Please. Uh, so I'm going to break it down like this. Like, yeah. I'm a big dude, right? And I mm-hmm. got to gotta get my health in order. But I would have weird-ass symptoms that, that were inexplicable. I mean, I was getting motion sickness at one point. I would feel dizzy if I had to go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. And I'd be freaked out. And I'd, like, go get myself checked up and do blood work and everything. And everything was coming back fine on paper. Mm-hmm. But I felt mm-hmm. like a disaster. And I know a lot of us, especially post-pandemic, a lot of us have gone through these things. Weird symptoms. Go check into the hospital. You don't know what's going on. So there's this dude, Dr. Josh Axe, on YouTube that I would highly recommend for people to check out. And he's a big proponent of the fact that all disease begins in the gut. Mm. And so what happened in 2021, I came back from up north. And I was really, I was bad. My digestion was bad. I couldn't eat. I was like going through a million issues. I got this Mohawk elder in my life, Sylvia. I love her dearly. She just knows what's going on with me. So she came to check me and I felt like I was dying. And she looked me up and down and she said, you just need collagen. Mm -hmm. I got to go buy it. And she drove off. And I'm like, what the fuck is collagen? I thought that's for like makeup and skin. Right. So I did my research and your gut is like 80% collagen. But what happens wow. as you age is that collagen starts to get depleted. And so what the collagen, and I'm not a scientist. I don't know this in detail, mm-hmm. but I can tell you as someone who lived through it. Right. We have a mesh in our gut that's responsible for filtering out toxins and sending the appropriate nutrients into the bloodstream. Mm-hmm. And over the years with a shitty lifestyle, eating habits, greasy foods, fast food, your net, your protective net starts to have holes poked into it. Mm. And so as those holes get poked into it and you continue to eat crap, that crap now starts filtering itself into your bloodstream. And now you're having symptoms of shit that nobody can trace. It can't come up in the blood work, but you know you're feeling like trash. Mm. And so you have to actively work to seal and heal the gut lining. And that process is not easy. Now, in addition to that, there's things like candida. It's like a yeast and it's like an overgrowth. And so these things can take hold of you and it feeds off of sugar. And so if you're not careful on your diet and your exercise regimen and your stress levels, all of this correlates with each other. You end up with a multitude of issues, symptoms and sicknesses that might not even be diagnosed. And you might end up having to live with this shit for years. Wow. But if you start to do that, that studying and that research for yourself, uh, there's a thing called the Health Institute. I'll send you the link for it. Okay. So I actually signed up and I took a course on how to heal leaky gut. Mm. And that began a whole mind-blowing journey for me, man. The collagen, bone broth soups. Like, you know, back home, we would get certain soups homemade and yeah. then they just feel good and then you're back out there. But then we come up here, we don't have that no more. Yeah. yeah. Or things like fish oil. You know, I grew up taking fish oil as a kid and then you just kind of stopped taking it as you got mm. older. So... All these things, all these supplements, all these foods are designed to heal us. And our parents and our grandparents' generation, more so our grandparents' generation, they were healthier. Yeah, They weren't having the health issues. Like, we having health issues in our 40s that they were having in their 80s. Yeah. You know, and so the gut is such an important aspect to take care of. And even if you don't have digestive issues, if you just got skin problems, that's gut. Yeah. There's a lot of things. Like, even right now, I think, I don't know if you see it, but I got a couple of things, like rash or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can't, was, I can't see it, but I know I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It was like ros- rosacea or whatever. This thing was terrible before. Mm-hmm. It, it was getting better. 
I got back to Toronto from Florida. I ate like an idiot for three days. It's like starting to come back. <laughs> so I'm back on the mix now. That's <laughs> What they want me, Derek? I'm a straight up dude, bro. Yeah, I ain't gonna lie to you. Uh, yeah. I was like, oh shit, I got curry chicken and good out. <laughs> yeah. Not, you know what I learned? <laughs> you know what I learned that blew my mind? Yeah. This goes to all my Caribbean people. So they put me on this thing called autoimmune paleo protocol. Okay. You, you can't eat a motherfucking thing on this, basically. But, well, no, you can. I'm not gonna lie. You can eat. You can eat meat, protein. You can eat veggies. But they gotta be certain veggies, and the right. meat gotta be like clean meat. It can't be like KFC or whatever. Right, right, right. right. So they cut out legumes like beans, lentils. Oh. I'm Latino, bro. What do you mean yeah. cutting out beans? <laughs> so I was on this protocol. I was eating clean, baked salmon, all this shit. And then one day I got, I got bad, sick, bad, and I couldn't figure it out. And when I thought back over the week and I looked at my food journal. I had had black beans. Mm. I grew up on that shit. Right. That beans is what has been fucking me up for these last few years. Wow. Back home, we would cook the beans in a pressure cooker. Yeah. The pressure cooker would break down all the lectins inside of the beans. But now we don't do none of that shit. Everything's fast. You eat it quick. Yeah. So all those lectins are not broken down. They get into our system and they start poking holes in the gut lining, and now you're back in the mix. Yo, there, bro. I felt like I was dying for like a week. I was just like, wow. And I remember the functional medicine doctor I went to see looking me in my face and smiling, and he says, "You're gonna have about a one week, two week period when you're just gonna feel like trash." And this motherfucker was smiling when he said that. So I left. At the first two weeks, I was actually fine. So I'm like, I got this shit. This thing. Yeah. But that third week, bro, oh, my God. <laughs> and I had the beans on top of it. I was a mess. Wow. I, was a mess, I didn't know what to do because I was eating salmon and fucking cabbage. I'm like, why am I sick? Yeah, yeah. I, I just had to get to that hump and kind of keep flushing out. Like, if, if, you're, if you're having health issues and you're listening to me and you're going to go through the detox, do it. It's going to be fucking hell. And the longer that you've ate like trash, yeah. the more challenging it's going to be to detox. But the other side of it is beautiful. Dope. Dope. And it's worth it. You just got to be disciplined and stick with it, you know. That, that's, that, that word right there has been the theme of my week, discipline. It's one, yeah. one thing that is connected to almost everything that we do. It's crazy you mentioned lectins because I read... Um, Oh, I can't remember the name of the book, but I have it upstairs and it's it's a, a doctor talking about lectins. And I didn't realize how many things that we eat that have lectins and the impact lectins have on us. And uh -huh. one thing that was an eye opener for me at the time when I read its book was it was talking about lectins being a defense mechanism for, you know, the things, the foods that we eat, like the, the greens. That's how they protect themselves when things uh -huh. are overly ripe they have a lot more lectins in them, which means it's going to have a more impact on you and your gut. So as you're speaking, I'm like, aha, I read the book. I understood the book, but here's somebody I'm speaking to who has gone through it. And Hell so, yeah, bro. Right? Yeah, so, yo, Derek, I am terrified of beans right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I love my Jamaican food, but fuck rice and beans, bro. It's white rice all the way. <laughs> The trauma is real. <laughs> oh, this PTSD like a motherfucker, bro. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. I was in Florida, they were selling these tamales, and I was so excited. They had a combo, and they had the cabbage and the carrot and the tamale. And then she opened up this pot. I'm like, what's in there? And then she pulls in a scoop of black beans. I was like, no! <laughs> like, the fucking farmer's market heard me yell. Like, get that shit off my <laughs> <laughs> that's not for me yep <laughs> oh <Okay>. man <laughs> facts i'll be able to eat it eventually yeah but but the feeling of trash that i get from it is not worth it bro yeah. and i've done a lot of detoxes and fasts in my life like up to 20 day fast but i have never cut out legumes in my mm. life and that's the shit that's been messing me up yeah. lentils chickpeas wow now, I want to shift gears a bit. You've been an advocate for so many other people, yeah. like for as long as I've known you. My first question here is, why do you care so much? <laughs> I care because I know what it feels like. 
you know, I care because when I worked at housing, I just envisioned that could be my mother going through the issues with the fridge or the bugs or whatever the fuck is going on in housing that these people mm-hmm. aren't fixing properly. I believe that that you know life will flip on you in an instant Mm -hmm. and if you get too comfortable you get too carried away you know that's why i said in the poem like you know not on the backs of the poor after all that they've been through plus karma is a real one homie one day it could be you yeah i really believe you know no one is immune to the trials and tribulations of life and so i want to cultivate as much good energy as possible Mm -hmm. to bring comfort to others and to know and it's almost like a gratitude because yeah. I've been protected, man. I've had, man, I've had people run shit on me, OB, all type of stuff. And I'm protected from it. It bounces back because I have a clean heart. I don't wish ill on people and I do my best to do right by people. I've also learned to do right by the right people because you can't cast your pearls in front of the swine. And sometimes when you have a heart as good as mine, you end up wasting a lot of energy in the wrong places Mm -hmm. you know so i've also learned to establish boundaries but i care brother because i want this world to be a better place man like you see um angel reese yeah i love this sister bro yep I i love her intelligence i love how i love how she dedicated it to the young black girls out there i love her because she knows and and she sees how the world is and how they the double standards and how when the white girl does it it's okay but when the black girl does it she's ghetto she's hood or whatever and i just connect with her so much you know yep. i've always rooted for the underdog in a sense and i've always you know i've been cast aside i've been kicked when i'm down left for dead forgotten you know yeah i want the world to be a better place and i want to leave my mark on it Dope, dope. Talk to me about One Mic Educators. That, oh, that initiative, I was looking it up and I'm just like, I'm a little envious. I gotta be, I gotta be honest. I'm a little envious that <laughs> I didn't get to jump in at the start. Um, and, you know, life happens where time is taken from you in so many ways. And I'm working on changing that. But talk to me about One Mic Educators. Why did you start it? And what is it about? And who's involved? Yeah, man. I mean, you're always welcome, bro. You're, you're, you're at day zero, bro. You're not even <laughs> there before one mic. <laughs> so one mic educators is, is is my arts education enterprise. It's also a collective. Uh I read this book called The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss, which I highly recommend to people. Yep. And he got me thinking on a business mindset with my art. So you know I do a lot. Uh, ideally artists just want to be on stage performing, getting paid and making the big bucks everywhere. But I did an analysis of where my money was coming from and it was coming from workshops. Mm-hmm. I was getting performances, but the real money was coming from workshops. Yeah. And so I said, you know what? I need to set up, a. I need to set this up as an enterprise mm-hmm. so that I can start running things through one mic educators as an enterprise. And through that, be able to afford myself to do the things I've always done, like give back to communities. And so um, initially we were just doing workshops in schools, me and my brother Tugstar, and we were going to a contact alternative. They always took care of us, man. I love that school. And, you know, it was a lot of hard-hitting youth. They've gone through a lot. Mm -hmm. And then we started to branch out and getting into other schools. Um, And then it really kind of took flight for me, man. I was able to get on to do some residencies and travel to indigenous territories. Mm -hmm. I uh, joined the League of Canadian Poets and they had some funding. So I was able to connect with the Health Suck Tribal Council and get out to Bella Bella in Northern BC Mm -hmm. and just start kind of like living my dream through the enterprise. And in 2016, we started the La Raza series, which is a spoken word, open mic series, uh, designed to feature indigenous black and latin american artists you know everyone's welcome but as far as the money that i've been able to raise and pay out it's all gone to like black indigenous latin american um artists and through that event we also started crowdfunding and donating to different causes so we donated to a legal defense fund for six nations territory uh family of regis krachinsky paquette 
our brother Sam and, and Lane, who was murdered, um, <laughs> I think last year or two years ago, we were able to raise some funding for his family. And we started doing these beautiful shows. And then when the pandemic hit, we just ran them virtually on Zoom. Oh. And we got like a whole collective now. We had a, a group of youth. We got a grant. My homegirl, Amoya Ray, she's like, she's like my heart, man. She's like an incredible poet. I would love for you to, to have her on your podcast, too. I would love to have her. And, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get you connected, man. So she she's kind of been my right hand, and she's guided me along the way. Always had my back. Jennifer mm-hmm. Alicia, an amazing uh, Mi'kmaq spoken word artist. And we got a little bit of funding to do this uh, Immigrant Indigenous Friendship video. Because similar to Guerrillas of the Word and Revolutionaries Honoring Your Mind's Eye and all that back in the day, mm-hmm. the politics is always going to be there, man. I can't not yeah. be involved. And yeah. so one thing I've realized with with the indigenous family I have in my life is when every time people are like, how can we support? How can we support? The answer we kept getting was identical. It said, build friendship. Get to know us. There's no mystical thing where you come down from the heavens and save us. No, just get to know us, make friends. And so I said, fuck it, we're going to make immigrant indigenous friendship a core principle of the business. Mm. Obviously, Black Lives Matter. No one is illegal. Yeah. You know, free Palestine. Like we have core principles. And through that, you know, I've gone, made deputations at the Catholic school board, uh, denouncing anti-black racism incidents that have occurred. Um, I want to start launching a a workshop series around how to make deputations, you know, Mm -hmm. and I want us to start kind of taking the power back. We were able to do consultations for Toronto police around the race-based data and all the discrimination that, you know, we know what it is. Yeah. But we were able to formalize that, get that documented, uh, helping build the anti-racism strategy for the Canadian government. Uh, We've done a lot. You know, we've been able to get the youth out to Six Nations. I've taken over a thousand youth out to Six Nations territory to like exchange with the elders and with the youth. I got youth that got caught up in charges that need a community hour. So I'll bring them up there. We'll do some work for the elders. Mm. They'll get their hours. They'll get some healing. They'll help the elders. And it's just like nonstop, brother. I started a Kings for Consent series to do some consent workshops to educate men around the importance of, of seeking consent. Um, I've got a new series that I'm going to interview you for, which is Journey to Manhood Dope. and Healing the Wounded Masculine. I'll you be know. honored. I'll be honored. <laughs> yeah, we're going to set that up, brother. We're going to set that up quick, fast. Dope. And so that series is kind of like a space for dudes to speak. There's a sister, Jamelia Gregory, that had me on, and I love her dearly because she kind of gave me the platform to really open up and share about my struggles. Mm-hmm. But she also celebrated me for the changes. Mm-hmm. And... You know, it helped me come out of the shell of realizing, like, it's okay. Yeah. Yes, I made my mistakes. Yes, I've, I've been hurtful in my past, but I'm not that guy anymore, and I want a better world, you know. And so I really kind of, like, see, they say um, do something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Yep. That's what One Mike Educators is, man. It's everything I love. And because I got the business sense from the Tim Ferriss book, I, everything I love doing is a business write up. Dope. Dope. You know what I mean? Dope. Because it's contributing to the business. Yeah. No, that's and what's then up. we got the collective and we got the open mic series and we got all the community work. And we just like we we're a dope squad, man. Like we'll go out, we'll we uh I got a friend that got a, a yurt and they do like a healing center and we just help they needed landscaping there. We weeds were overgrown and I just went five deep. Uh, we just spend the day doing landscaping for them, just on the strength. Dope, dope, oh, man. Yeah, man. We'll I'll bring you out with us, man. It's a, it's a fun time. Nah, that's dope. That's dope. I know. I know how challenging it can be when you're trying to get into the school boards and and whatnot. There's a lot of red tape you got to deal with. So commend you for being able to break through those walls and get them to you know you know allow you to come through their doors and share everything that you guys are doing because I see the impact. I've I've done some work in the past with the schools and. I can see the impact when you're working with the young people or the teachers, you can see it. You can see the change happening. But the problem, as you already know, when they close the door and they say it's because of funding. And even when you have organizations in the past that would say, but we're willing to come for free. We didn't ask you for money. 
and they still sometimes don't open the doors and they give you another red tape to have to hurt you know hurdle over and whatnot so kudos to you guys man because i know how challenging it can be i know sure. firsthand like it's it's not easy especially when you're coming to talk about real things yep right and, and that's why the doors get closed yeah yeah because it's too real like <laughs> right so but kudos to you guys man that's one mic uh educators and i think everybody should definitely check it out Def the link will be there so don't have any excuses to why you, you didn't get to that website it'll be there for you and also i'll make sure i include um spins contact on social media so that you can get access to him and kind of dive in and just you know grab as much as you possibly can now while I was on the website, I came across an, a poem that I had heard you recite a while back, and it was called Manhood. Yeah. What was the message in that poem? The reason why I'm plugging that poem, because another reason for people to go on that website to check it out there, um, yeah. and so that they can get access to everything that's there. So talk to me about that poem, and why was that so significant that you needed to write I'm that I'm glad poem? you brought that up, man. So Manhood is is my my, you know... My uh, poem starts, my concept of manhood had been asked backwards longer than I could remember. Mm -hmm. You know, growing up, I never, much like the young man I met today, growing up, I never really had a father. Mm -hmm. And so for me as a man, young man growing up, my, my teachings of what manhood was came from hip hop. And like fucking hip hop in the 90s. <laughs> That's so distorted. That's all. <laughs> You know, it's funny like when you say now, like <laughs> no, sorry. When you think about it, when you say that, the play on words and, and the watch this, check this out. You said is ass backwards. You know what came to mind when you said that? And you said huh. the 90s crisscross. Literally, right? Right. I right. forgot that shit. I, I, was, I had a super cat playlist. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. That, that's it. So, so that poem was, was created because I wanted to share a message to the dudes. Like, yo, check, check, check us. You know, mm -hmm. like I'm not trying to preach from a pulpit. I'm, that's where I'm really transparently acknowledging my own shortcomings as a man. Mm -hmm. And then also saying, like, how many of you men ever bother to keep these men in check? You know, pointing at myself, because a lot of times we let our homies go and check their behavior. Yeah. You know, I ain't going to have a motherfucker barking at a woman in the side of the street out of my car. That motherfucker's taking the bus home the second that happens. Yeah. I'm not, I'm past that, you know. Yeah. And, and then the homies would be like, oh, you're a square. You're this thing. No, bro, stop doing that shit. Yeah. Like, it's not, fuck are you doing? You know, yeah. it's, it's, I don't want that. So that poem was really kind of, written to share that and to also acknowledge that I went through that. I used to think that the more women I slept with was made me a bigger man or tall. like it's all bullshit. You know, mm. at the end of the day, it's all it's, it's this unnecessary pressure that leads to so much problems. And I think a very important message there, like with my with my uncle Don Rodas, like may he rest in peace, you know, he he was he had alcoholism issues mm -hmm. and he was also very macho and that's a big problem in my country and i think in general man like a mm -hmm. lot of people men will hide their emotions mm -hmm. they, they won't cry because a man doesn't cry be a man but then they'll go and like destroy themselves uh internally in my case my uncle like the drinking and the alcohol and and it's actually 10 times worse than just fucking crying. Yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? like, but you know, you know, it's crazy. Um, it's not a defense that I'm throwing out here, but I've learned over the years that a lot of men don't know how to cry. Yeah. They don't know. And, and those who are able to break through that, that, you know, that point and actually be able to cry actually are changed in some ways, right? Because now they realize the power in letting loose and letting that out because that's really what it is. And that's where I think the term outcry comes from because it's an external thing. Like you have to release some of this stuff that's, you know, pent up inside, but we don't know how to cry. Then we've never seen it. We never had anyone demonstrate it. Uh, and so we don't know what it means. And when the fact that we've been told and conditioned to believe that when you cry is a sign of weakness, that's, 
the manipulation right there, right? That's where we bought into that. And now we're believing that, oh, I got to be hard all the time. Meanwhile, I feel like I should let this thing out by crying or some other way, but not the violence and not the, the hard exter exterior that we always present, right? And you know, one, one other step I'll go forward, and I don't want to generalize, but mm -hmm. I do feel that this toxic masculinity has got so bad that some women don't know how to receive our kids. Yes, yes. You know, and it's not a slight against women at all. It's, it's again, bringing back to how fucked up this toxic masculinity is. Yeah. That some women will not know how to receive our tears. And I had to have a lot of talks with my queen about this. Yeah. Because I'm like, baby, I need to cry. Like, you don't understand how bad shit will get if I don't cry. Yep. Like, let me. Yep. And I remember I had a moment one day, like, you know, like Kendrick son, shut the fuck up when love's talking. Mm -hmm. Like, I had a, I had an episode where it happened and I listened. And then I called my queen because I was so moved by what had just happened. And I was, but I was like fighting back the tears. Yeah. yeah. And I remember her saying, let it out, baby. Let it out. Yeah. And like that moment was like one of the sweetest memories I have in this relationship. Because I cried, I cried like a motherfucker, man. I was under a lot of pressure. I was uh, in the middle of reviving a business I inherited from my stepfather after he passed. And I was so stressed. And I just had a moment where God just like said, it's going to be okay. Mm. And so I wanted to tell her the story, but she could sense me fighting the tears. And she's done a lot of work on her end to, to receive my tears. And so that moment when she said, let it out, baby. Yeah. Um, it was just so beautiful, man. Man, that's powerful. Now, I'm not saying go around bawling every five seconds. <laughs> 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 no, nah, we're not trying to do that. We're not trying to do that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If that's how you go to fucking therapy, but... But for all the you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's... <laughs> oh, man. I can only imagine, eh? A bunch of guys just crying down the street. Like... <laughs> So this this is a perfect way for me to segue this here. So I have a portion in the in the show where I ask you the most random question, right? Ready, well, let's go. Right. So and you got to pick one of these two options, all right? Now, would you rather? And you got to explain why you chose one of these options, right? You got to choose one, but you got to explain why. Now, would you rather have to listen to only Justin Bieber? Oh, shit. <laughs> or only Ariana Grande for the oh, rest of your life. <laughs> Justin Bieber. <Bieber. laughs> Talk to me. I want to know why. <laughs> First of all, I can't even fucking name you an Ariana Grande. <laughs> If I'm not mistaken, she was with Mac Miller, right? <laughs> I have no idea who she is either, but I just thought I would love it when you pick one. <laughs> nah, Justin Bieber, out of the way, bro. You <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> no, no, <I'm> pretty... <laughs> He's so yeah, traumatized. Yeah, I Ariana Grande's song, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's dope that's dope now, I, I usually throw those randoms in there just to break it up if it gets a little heavy sometimes just to yeah. you know lighten it up but thank you for participating on that <laughs> for sure bro <laughs> if, if you could improve I know you've you mentioned quite a, a few areas that you've already worked on in your life but if you can improve two areas specifically of your life what would they be like right now yeah um like discipline with my physical health mm -hmm. it's, it's uh finding the balance because i got a lot of shit to do like i got you know i quit my job yes but i still got financial responsibilities you know yeah. my queen uh looks to me as a provider like she she told me she was talking with her mother and she said i'm a provider and that's again one of the sweetest things like as a man, you hear the woman of your of your dreams saying that about you. You gotta deliver. So, being a provider calls on me to do a lot of fucking work, and then it kind of limits me from the physical. Mm. So, one thing I definitely will do, especially you motivated me this podcast, is find that balance where I can go get the exercise, go shoot the hoops, cook, whatever it is, just do something for my health every day Dope. to uh to get that balance going. Man, we can't allow ourselves to get so consumed by anything that we stop taking care of our own health. Dope, dope. What's the second and area? And then the second area, I would say financial management, man. 
Mm. Like, uh, I'm in my budget, I do my thing. But yeah, I just get into these YOLO streaks sometimes, man. And then you wind up looking at your bank account, like, what the fuck happened? <laughs> that's dope that's dope (laughs) so what's what's next what's next for spin man um i got a brother uh el uno in atlanta and we're in very fairly similar trajectories of our career man we we both have a book that we need to get done Mm -hmm. so that's a must i gotta finish my book um I'm going into the rap, bro. Like, I just actually re- worked on a verse yesterday. No like, it's way. Like, a hip-hop verse of the poem. Yeah, it's coming, dope, bro. Dope, dope, yeah, I got my homie Leroy Esco. Like, I got a lot of dope artists that I listen to are, are like, my homies. And, mm. like, I got the opportunity to start rapping. So, I need to break through that barrier. And I honestly want to amass revenue in a way that allows me to give back to others, man. I mm. want to bless like young single mothers with scholarships for their children. Dope. I want to um, coordinate the investments the way like these rich people do it. Like there's, yeah. there's strategies here and I want to crack all these codes so that I can, you know, bless our people with them, man. Like, uh, obviously I want to be comfortable as well. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be losing some weight. Like I've lost 30 pounds from the start of the year. Oh, that's big. And, uh, well, probably 20 after the week that I had you. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to get it back to baby. I'm on a mission, bro. I got to get that time my high school athletic physique back. Like, that's definitely a critical part of this year. No. And um, just being a successful businessman, bro. Like, and you know, it- actually, so I had, with the hearing clinic that I, that I, my mother and I were trying to, were, were, were working to, keep alive in my father's and my stepfather's legacy mm-hmm. man i've had to make a lot of decisions man like i made a decent amount of money but 95 percent of it went back into overhead went into debts mm-hmm. and went into the salary for the staff and i was really like what am i doing like this is not what i thought being a business owner would be but i, I learned the patience of it all yeah. You know, I'm I'm going through that phase right now that you hear people talk about in their bios and their movies and shit. Mm. Well, something big is happening and I just need to stay on top of it, which will then allow me to bless other people. Yeah. I'm not like a flashy guy. I don't give a fuck about name brands or whatever. I just want to be able to bless other people and be comfortable. Dope. You know, and so I'm on a mission to do that, man. I've seen this meme. It said we do this not because it's easy. But well, because we thought it would be easy. <laughs> get that That's my shit, bro. <laughs> Man, that is dope. I love that. I love that. <laughs> how, how can how can others connect with you and learn about what you're doing, the initiatives and things that you're about to roll out so they can support? Can you give them that I information? Think, uh, Instagram, one mic that educators and Twitter educators, one mic. Um, help me grow, grow those channels, man, especially the Twitter, man. Twitter's been dead. Dope. I got on this chat GPT. I don't know if you messed around with it. Yeah. I, I love it, bro. It's, yeah. it's been giving me guidance on how to start to grow the handle. So I'm, I'm taking it a day at a time Dope. and I'm seeing the results. And so I just got to be consistent with it. That's it. Um, I got the website, one mic educatorsca mm-hmm. That's really where you can see a lot of it happening, and, and I'm motivated. We, we're up for an award for the Toronto Art Foundation, a Arts for Youth Award. It's a $20,000 award. If we get it, I'll find out on the 17th. Dope. Um, prayerfully, you know, we get blessed with that. Yeah, man. I and think... we just going to continue to do the work, man. We got some ceremonies, a Mayan ceremony we're going to be going to do, and, and uh, uh, Mohawk territory later this summer. Wow. And uh, yeah, just I'm bringing back the open mic series in person. So we're definitely going to feature you there as well. Dope. Dope. Down by dope. Dope. And dope. we're just going to continue grinding, man. You're, you're going to see us, man. One mic educators. Dope. Yeah. Dope. Man, could you share? We're almost at the end here. Could you share one important life lesson that you've learned recently or in the past that you think the listeners can take away and actually? you know, develop 
or, or become a different person or even just take it on their journey and, and do what they need to do? Any advice that you Cal can share? Calculated leaps of faith. Calculated. Expand on that a bit. So, so I'm 44 and I had a job with seniority, like I said in the poem, benefits, mm -hmm. the whole nine. But it was killing me inside. It was, it mm -hmm. was killing my health. The stress, the cortisol, that will mess you up. And I realized I have to quit. I, I wasn't joking. I really was about to slap the shit out of one of the supers because yep. he just erased his motherfucker. And I was like, what am I doing here? Like, I, I ran consultations for the federal government. I linked my homies up with a contract with the federal department of justice. And I'm arguing with this motherfucking super about putting a bolt lock on the door. Get, I got to go. Yeah. And so when I say calculate a leap of faith, I'm not saying just take a leap of faith and fuck it. Like, no, have like a plan. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I had I have my here my, my business that I that I've been working at. I have my art and I had these artist residencies. I had twenty five thousand dollars worth of contracts lined up. I said, fuck it, I'm quitting mm -hmm. and I'm gonna figure this out. And I had another homie that quit a city job two years ago and he's been supporting me. Dope. I love this dude, Phil, Phil Edwards. And so he's been giving me some guidance. So I've been following it, doing my own version, never been reliant on just one thing. Mm -hmm. So I quit the job. I had a couple of opportunities set up for income, and then one of them got taken away from me, man. I lost 25 grand worth of contracts. Wow. Fucked up my whole first quarter of this year. Mm. But that also motivated me to just double down and work harder yeah. and not give up. Don't. So the, the calculated leap of faith is like, yeah, you got to take a leap of faith sometimes, but make sure you got a plan in place. Yeah. yeah. And, and have a backup plan, too, the plan just in case, because... The plan I had blew up in my face, but I still had a second backup mm -hmm. and I went to town on it. You Dope. know, and when you own your own business, the beauty of it is if you work hard, you will see a result yeah. as opposed to these these jobs as just exploiting people. No matter how hard you work, you're not going to see a result. You're just going to make everybody else around you rich. Yeah. yeah. So I would definitely tell, tell the people, calculate a leap of faith and choose health over anything. Dope. Choose your health because it won't matter if you got a million dollars and you're, and you're sick. That's a fact. None of that matters, man. All these motherfuckers would trade all their money quick for us to get help. Yep, on. yep. Well, they, they fly across the world to get doctors to help them. Yeah. <laughs> so so they I think the second lesson I would also say is, like, go where the love is. Ooh. If you're not feeling loved, if you're not feeling appreciated, go where the love is. Dope. Because nothing else fucking matters, man. Yeah, yeah. Thank you yeah. for that, man. That's, man. To end it all, my final question for you, my brother, is... When it's all said and done, how mm. would you want to be remembered? A real motherfucker, man. <laughs> <laughs> dope, dope. Who became a rapper? That's it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm putting it out into the universe. Yep. The rap album will be coming soon. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. We're not playing. <laughs> man. I, I want to thank you for blessing me with this opportunity to connect with you again. I know it's been some time, but I'll make sure we stay connected and keep it going because this is rich, man. I, I'm I'm happy that a lot of people got to hear your voice in this setting and learn about you, you know, in, in a different way than what they're going to learn more about on the website. But it's an honor to have you here with me this evening. And um, I can't thank you enough, man. Like this means a whole lot to me just because of, again, the respect that I have for you, the humility that you have, that you display, the fact that you're able to put your heart on your sleeve, no matter where you are, people know who you are. They know what you're they're getting. If they book you for a show, they know you're not going to hold your tongue. If mm. they, you know what I mean? And that's, that's the part that is very inspirational for me because as long as I've known you, you've spoken what was on your mind and your heart. And, mm -hmm. You know, if it's wrong or hurt somebody's feelings, you're also not afraid to come back later and apologize for it. But yeah. you're not apologizing for what you said. You're apologizing for the fact that it hurt them, but you still own everything that you say. And that's the part of you that I really, really, really admire and, and respect and, and love. So continue to do that. Don't change that. I think people benefit from it even when it hurts because they don't know that it benefits until later on when they're able to reflect on it, when the emotions oh. are gone. Right. And so. I just want you to know that I think that's what makes you special. And that's what people gravitate towards is that your transparency. And so thank you for just being who you are. 
you know what I mean? No, I appreciate you, brother. Thank you, too. The love is there. The one mic doors is always open for you. You got VIP everywhere, bro. Like, man. You're a real one, man. I appreciate you, too, man. It's been an honor for me to be on this. Man. So, for the listeners, I want to thank you for tuning in every week. And until next episode, love, peace, and nappiness.